I welcome you to this lecture on the vertebral column. At the conclusion of this lecture, you as a learner should be able to describe the vertebral segments and the number of vertebrae in each segment. You should be able to describe the vertebral curvatures and their formation, describe the formation of intervertebral foramina and their clinical significance, describe the structural blueprint of a typical vertebra, compare and contrast the structural features of vertebral segments, and then lastly, you should be able to describe the vertebral articulations and ligaments and their uh, functions. Uh, then we'll summarize the important take-home messages, and then uh, lastly, uh, provide attribution uh, for the images that were used uh, throughout this uh, lecture. Uh, here is a body map to quickly orient us to the region uh, of interest. Uh, and we're going to focus here on the posterior uh, view. And you see this furrow right down uh, the midline. This uh, furrow represents uh, the location of structural er elements of our vertebral column. And this would uh, be the spinous processes. So we're going to be looking right along this area uh, to define the segmentation of the vertebral column. Uh, first, let's uh, take a look at some basic concepts uh, of the vertebral column. And our starting point is with segmentation. What we have within the vertebral uh, column are various uh, segments. We will have a cervical segment, and that is represented by the first seven vertebrae that we see here in the anterior view. And then we also see uh, the seven vertebrae uh, posteriorly. The thoracic segment uh, will be the next 12 uh, vertebrae. And uh, we see the general location of the thoracic vertebrae in through here. And then posteriorly, uh, we were looking uh, in this general uh, region for our 12 thoracic uh, vertebrae. Just inferior to the thoracic segment, we have the lumbar uh, region, and we have five lumbar vertebrae. And our starting point here is, let's go with L5, the fifth lumbar vertebra. So there is the fifth one. Above it is four, three, two, and then one. So here we have the five lumbar vertebrae. And then posteriorly, if we start with the last one, five, there's five, four, three, two, one. Uh, the next uh, segment is the sacrum, and in the adult form, the sacrum uh, is formed by a fusion of five vertebrae. And then lastly, uh, we have the coccyx. Coccygeal vertebrae typically will number four. Uh, however, there is some anatomic variability. You may have three coccygeal vertebrae, or you may have as many uh, as five. But we're going to stick to the number four. And so if we add 7, 12, 5, 5, and 4, uh, we have 33 uh, vertebrae uh, within the vertebral column. The vertebral column also will present uh, two curvatures, a primary curvature and a secondary uh, curvature. If we look at primary curvature, curvatures, we are born with these. De these will develop uh, during the fetal period. And there are two primary uh, curvatures uh, that develop. Uh, the first is the thoracic curvature that we see in through this area. Uh, anterior is to our left, posterior is to uh, our right in this lateral view. And if you look at it anteriorly, you will note that the thoracic primary curvature is concave. The other primary curvature is the sacral curvature, and it too uh, is concave. And we'll pause here just for a moment of reflection. Let me ask uh, a basic uh, question uh, related to the uh, curvatures, the primary curvatures. Why would we want to have or wish to have uh, primary curvatures in the thoracic and sacral areas that are uh, concave uh, in their appearance. And the reason that we want to ha have these concave primary curvatures 
is to increase the volume within the thoracic cavity to house our thoracic organs or viscera. Similarly, in the pelvic area, which is a, a very narrow uh, region anatomically, we'll have a primary curvature here to house the pelvic viscera. Secondary curvatures, of which there are cervical and lumbar secondary curvatures, are going to develop uh, after birth, and they will represent developmental uh, milestones. So if we take a look here in the lateral view of the vertebral column, we see our cervical secondary curvature, this level, and if we look anteriorly, we see uh, that it projects in a convex manner. Also, the lumbar curvature, which we see here, has a convexity to it as well. Uh, what happens developmentally when you think about an infant starting to lift its head, that's when you'll start to develop the cervical secondary curvature. Then the infant is, a few months later, going to learn to walk. And when the infant starts to stand on his or her feet and starts to walk, the lumbar secondary uh, curvature uh, will develop. One might also ask, how do these curvatures uh, develop? The primary curvatures uh, are due to the differences in the height of vertebral bodies. So if we take a look here, we're looking at a thoracic vertebra. Here's the anterior portion of the body, and here's the posterior uh, portion of the body. Cannot really perceive it here, uh, but the anterior height of the vertebral body is a little bit shorter than the posterior height. Therefore, these are somewhat wedge-shaped, and when you stack multiple thoracic vertebrae upon one another, you will then develop uh, this primary curvature. Same thing happens uh, with the sacral vertebrae uh, as well. The secondary curvatures, again, develop uh, at developmental milestones, and what we have between the vertebral bodies are intervertebral uh, discs. And so when you develop your secondary curvatures, you'll have a height difference between the anterior part of the disc and the posterior part of the disc, such that the anterior portion will be thicker than its posterior portion. And then that will confer the convexity that we see to our secondary curvatures. Uh, one of the basic uh, functions of the vertebral column is to protect the spinal cord and the spinal uh, nerves that issue from the spinal uh, cord. Uh, once those spinal nerves are, are formed, they need a doorway or an exit uh, outwards, and uh, that is uh, mediated by the presence of intervertebral foramina. And if we take a look, when we stack our uh, vertebrae upon one another, uh, we will see these openings or spaces here, and these are the inner vertebral foramina. And the typical spinal nerve will be transmitted at each of these particular levels as we move up or as we move down the vertebral column. These intervertebral foramina may become stenotic, and when they become stenotic, they may put or compress uh, the typical spinal nerve that leaves the foramen, and as a result, neurologic symptoms can be uh, felt by the individual affected. Uh, as a consequence, then, these are loci of clinical interest. Now we need to stop at this particular uh, slide and to understand what the structural uh, blueprint uh, is of a typical vertebra. Once we understand this basic structural uh, blueprint, we can better understand the segmental specification that exists as we move from one vertebral segment uh, to another. So here is the basic blueprint. It is quite simple in this slide, but in this view, looking down upon the vertebra, and then in the lateral view, we see this prominent structure. This is referred to as the body of the vertebra. 
And if we go up to the superior view, the upper image here, and look posteriorly to the vertebral body, we will see that we have a vertebral arch that attaches to the body. And this vertebral arch has several different elements that are associated with it. But what you see here in this central aspect defined by the body and the arch is the vertebral foramen. This is what houses the spinal cord and it's covering the meninges. Now this slide helps you understand the complexity of the vertebral arch. And there are various components that are associated with the vertebral arch. And these components are referred to as pedicles, laminae, and processes. So we'll begin with the pedicles. The pedicles are these stout processes that are connected to the vertebral body. These then project posteriorly, and then when you come out here, you'll see connected to each pedicle is this sheet or flat bone-like component, and each one of these is a lamina. So here's a lamina on this side, here's a lamina on this side, and then uh, they project toward the posterior midline, and where they join, we will then have one of our seven uh, processes. This happens to be the spinous process. These here projecting out laterally where the pedicles join the laminae, transverse processes here. And then we have four different articular processes. Here in the upper image, looking down upon the superior aspect of this vertebra, we see two superior articular processes. If we take a look at the lateral view, we see those same articular processes looking like ears projecting upwards, but here are the other two, and these are inferiorly uh, oriented. So again, the vertebral arch is made up of two pedicles, two laminae, seven processes, and it's also probably important at this point to also uh, demonstrate how the intervertebral uh, foramen is formed because the pedicles are going to be notched. And so if we take a look here at the superior aspect of our two pedicles, we have a superior notch represented here. And if we take a look at the inferior aspect, uh, we see a very prominent uh, inferior notch. And when those two notches uh, join together, that will then define the intervertebral foramen. Now that we understand the basic structural blueprint uh, of a typical vertebra, we can utilize that uh, blueprint to understand segmental vertebral specification. Uh, so as we move from one segment to another, cervical to thoracic to lumbar, sacral, what are the modifications that are made to this basic structural blueprint? And let's begin with the cervical segment by looking at the uh, modifications that are uh, placed upon the cervical vertebrae. Uh, the first is that if we look at uh, the vertebral bodies of several of these cervical uh, vertebrae, we will see that they have these superiorly oriented uh, processes. And again, these are unique to the cervical vertebrae, and these are referred to as uncinate uh, processes. We can also see transverse processes. They alone are not unique to the cervical uh, segment, but here if we look up right in through here, uh, we can see an opening within the transverse process that's referred to as the transverse foramen. So transverse foramina are signature or hallmark features of the transverse processes of the cervical uh, segments. Uh, lastly, we have some tubercles uh, that are associated uh, with the transverse processes. And those are best seen uh, at this level of the transverse portion of the cervical vertebra. And this projection here is the posterior tubercle. And then if we look uh, right in through here, 
uh, we have an anterior tubercle uh, as well. Uh, this particular slide is uh, demonstrating the first of two uh, unique uh, cervical uh, vertebrae, and this one happens to be C1, also known uh, as the atlas. Uh, we have two images here, so the first thing I want to do is kind of orient you uh, to uh, the views that are shown here. Uh, this is a superior view of C1. This is the anterior aspect of C1. And then this is the posterior aspect of C1 in a superior view. The image below is an inferior view. And again, this would be the anterior portion. And this would be the posterior portion. Now let's focus on the unique or signature features here of C1. And the first thing you're going to note is that C1 is a ring-like structure. And as you move about the ring, you will not see a body. C1 does not have a body, so that makes it extremely uh, unique. Uh, if you look out here laterally, uh, you see the superior articular uh, processes that C1 has. Uh, in the superior view, these articulate uh, with the occipital bone of the skull. And if you look in fairly, you see articular processes as well, and these will articulate uh, with the superior articular processes of the vertebra below. In that case, uh, that would be C2, also known as the axis. These processes, the superior ones and the inferior ones, are associated with lateral masses. So we see the lateral mass on this side, and we see the lateral mass on the opposite side of C1. Connecting the lateral masses together are two arches. So here is your anterior arch, and then here is your posterior arch. And the same thing in the inferior view, where we have the anterior arch, and then here is your posterior arch. Associated uh, with each arch is its respective tubercle. So if we take a look at the anterior arch, we see the anterior tubercle here. If we look at the posterior arch, we see the posterior tubercle. And we can also see what is a signature feature of all uh, cervical vertebrae. If we take a look at the transverse process here and over here, uh, we can more clearly uh, see the transverse foramina. Uh, the transverse foramina uh, will transmit the vertebral artery and vertebral uh, vein. The second very unique uh, vertebral component of the cervical segment uh, is a C2. C2 is known as the axis, so the atlas can rotate or pivot about uh, C2. The signature feature of C2 that will give it away, so it's very easy to recognize, uh, is this single tooth-like uh, process called the dens or the odontoid process, odontoid in reference to a tooth-like uh, structure or eminence. The body is shown in this area, so we do have a body. Uh, we also have pedicles that will connect the body to laminae. So here we see the two laminae, and then the laminae uh, unite posteriorly uh, in the midline, and we can see uh, the spinous process that is now associated with C2. And it, uh, as seen in a previous slide, uh, is bifid. And again, transverse processes, each housing its own uh, transverse foramen. Now that we uh, understand the segmental specification of the uh, cervical uh, vertebrae, uh, our next stop uh, along the vertebral column as we move distally or inferiorly is that of the uh, thoracic uh, vertebrae. Signature feature, unless there's an anatomic variation, but the signature feature here of our thoracic uh, vertebrae is going to be the presence of facets for uh, the ribs. And so if we take a look here, we do see a, a rib. And again, if you don't, don't have a variation, ribs are going to only articulate 
with thoracic uh, segments of our vertebral column. Uh, this portion of the rib is articulating with a facet on the vertebral body. And then on the opposite side with the rib uh, removed, uh, we see where that uh, point of articulation uh, would be. Laterally, we have a clearer view of how ribs will articulate with the vertebral bodies. Typically, ribs will articulate uh, with two uh, adjacent vertebral uh, bodies um, with the head of the rib doing that point of articulation. Another point of articulation is seen here where a portion of the rib articulates with a facet that is found on the transverse uh, process. Some other features uh, associated with thoracic vertebrae uh, is that the vertebral foramen is smaller than in the cervical area. And then vertebral bodies will become larger as you progressively move inferiorly along the vertebral column. And then if you take a look here, spinous processes tend to be much longer than the other vertebral uh, segments and they will slope or slant uh, inferiorly. Next, uh, let's take a look at the segmental vertebral specification uh, for our lumbar vertebrae. And once you get into the lumbar area, a most obvious structural change is that the vertebral bodies get even larger uh, than what we saw above this particular segmental uh, level. And the reason that these vertebral bodies have to become much more massive is that they're supporting uh, a greater weight of the body as gravity pulls those forces in fairly. The vertebral foramen, if we look at it, it tends to be triangular with the base of the triangle oriented here uh, along the vertebral body and then the apex forming at the level of the spinous process. Spinous processes uh, tend to be short and stout and uh, we can see a spinous process at this particular uh, level. And there are two signature uh, processes that are associated uh, with lumbar vertebrae. Uh, the first of these are associated with the superior articular uh, processes. And if we look here, uh, we see one of these prominences and we see one on the opposite side. And these are referred to as mammillary uh, processes. Associated with the transverse processes, and we can see one of those here uh, fairly clearly, and we see another one kind of over here as well, and we see them here post anteriorly. Uh, these are accessory uh, processes. And there's a ligament that will connect a mammillary process to uh, an accessory process with two adjacent vertebrae, and mammillary processes also serve as a point of attachment for a muscle that we find in the deep uh, back, the multifidus. Our next uh, stop um, segmentally is to understand the specification uh, that's associated uh, with the sacrum. And here we're looking at an adult sacrum where the five sacral vertebrae uh, have fused. Uh, this is a posterior view that we're looking at. And the first thing that we should note are these superior structures here and here. These are superior articular processes associated with the sacrum. These then will articulate with the inferior articular processes of the fifth lumbar uh, vertebra. If we look right here in the posterior midline, uh, we see what is referred to as the median sacral uh, crest. And when we think about the sacral vertebrae uh, fusing together here in this posterior orientation, let's think about the structures that uh, lie superior to this uh, segment. And in that posterior midline, we had spinous processes. So what happens here in the sacrum is that spinous processes of adjacent vertebrae will fuse to produce this median sacral uh, crest. We also have an intermediate uh, sacral crest that's less uh, noticeable. 
but it's going to be produced by uh, articular processes, superior and inferior sacral articular processes that are now uh, fused in this adult uh, form. And then lastly, we have uh, lateral uh, sacral uh, crests. And uh, these are going to uh, represent the point of fusion of uh, transverse uh, processes. And uh, we also then will see here posteriorly uh, openings uh, for branches of sacral spinal nerves. And we have uh, four that come into view here, and we have four that come in uh, to view uh, here. Right in through here, we have the sacral uh, canal, and so this uh, results when the individual sacral uh, foramina will fuse together. And then down below, uh, we see an area uh, that did not uh, fuse posteriorly, and as a result of the laminae of S5 and excuse me, the laminae of S5 here failed to fuse, and as a result, that will form the sacral uh, hiatus. Uh, here is an anterior view uh, of the sacrum. Uh, the first thing to note uh, is the superior aspect of the anterior body of S1, uh, this is a very prominent structure referred to as the sacral uh, promontory, and it is uh, readily uh, visible, discernible on radiographs, and it helps you identify your vertebral level uh, very, very uh, readily. These lateral extensions at this level are wing-like extensions in the anatomic uh, terminology that we'll utilize for wing-like uh, insections uh, are, is ala. We also have these areas here, and these represent the points of fusion between sacral bodies. Here's the sacral body at this level, sacral body here, and this represents the point of fusion between those sacral bodies. Similarly, this area here is the fusion point between S1 and S2. These are transverse ridges or transverse uh, lines. The inferior aspect, so the inferior most projection uh, of the uh, sacrum, is termed the apex. And then we also have uh, foramina that are oriented uh, anteriorly, and these foramina will allow for the transmission of branches of the typical uh, spinal sacral nerves at this level. Uh, here's a lateral uh, view. Uh, of the sacrum, and uh, it has a prominent feature that we see here shaded in blue. Uh, here we have articular uh, cartilage, and so this is the articular uh, region of the sacrum, and this point of articulation is with uh, the ilium. And we would have another uh, articular surface on the opposite side of the sacrum to uh, articulate with the opposite uh, ilium. And then our last uh, segment uh, is the coccyx. Uh, generally, uh, it will have four uh, fused coccygeal uh, vertebrae, and that's exactly what we see uh, in this view. Here's the first, here's the second, third, and then here's our fourth coccygeal vertebra. But again, there is some anatomic variability. We may have three, may have uh, even up uh, to five. If we focus on the first coccygeal uh, vertebra, uh, it will have these prominent horn-like uh, projections, and um, uh, these are referred to as the cornea. And the cornea will often uh, uh, fuse uh, with uh, the sacrum. Now let's understand uh, the various types of articulations uh, that we have uh, within the vertebral uh, column. And the first type of joint or articulation uh, 
you want to understand is that that exists between the articular uh, processes, superior to inferior. And uh, these are referred to as zygopophysial articulations or joints. And if we take a look here, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five uh, vertebrae represented. We see costal facets here uh, on the bodies of these uh, vertebrae. So these are thoracic. And then we get down to this level, uh, we no longer see costal facets. Uh, so we know that we're looking at lumbar vertebra one and two. But what we want to focus in on is this area here or here, for example. Here we have the inferior articular process of this vertebra above. And then the vertebra below here has its superior articular process. And then as a result, we form this type uh, of joint. There are segmental uh, differences in the orientation of the zygapophysial uh, joints uh, that will confer different ranges of motion uh, from one uh, segment to another. So if we look at the cervical region, uh, the orientation of these articulations uh, would be uh, somewhat oblique uh, in nature, allowing for conferring greater range of motion. Within the thoracic area, the orientation of these joints is more in an anterior, uh, posterior uh, direction. Uh, that will help to limit, to some degree, the range of motion. In addition, at the thoracic uh, level, we uh, have superimposed here uh, the ribs, and that will further restrict the range of motion. And then within the lumbar uh, segment, uh, the greatest uh, restriction in movements imposed uh, because of the more lateral orientation uh, of these uh, particular articulations. This particular uh, slide is demonstrated, demonstrating a type of joint referred to as a symphysis. The plural of that is symphysis. Uh, and simply, an anatomic symphysis is shown in through here. This is a fibrocartilaginous joint. Uh, so this type of joint is found between our vertebral bodies, and the structural component of this type of joint is going to be the intervertebral disc. This region here represents the intervertebral disc with a vertebral body above, vertebral body up below. 24 of these are present uh, within the uh, vertebral uh, column. Uh, you do not have one between uh, C1 and C2, nor do you have intervertebral discs arranged within the sacral region nor the coccygeal uh, region. So you'll have 24. An intervertebral disc has an outer ring called the annulus uh, fibrosis. And the uh, tissue that constitutes the annulus fibrosis is fibrocartilage. And then the central component, which is kind of hard to really demonstrate here, uh, becomes less distinct as one ages uh, in the more central gelatinous component of an intervertebral disc uh, would represent the nucleus pulposus, uh, which, uh, which is a remnant of the notochord. Uh, there are also M plates here on the inferior aspect of the superior vertebral body and on the superior aspect of the inferior vertebral body, and these M plates are uh, composed of hyaline as well as fibrocartilage. Uh, some ligaments uh, that are associated with the uh, vertebral column. There are several, some more than important uh, than others in what we want to take home from this particular lecture. Uh, but you as a learner should understand, uh, uh, quite importantly, our anterior and posterior uh, longitudinal ligaments. Uh, here we're looking uh, at an anterior view and we see the anterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, it's going to run uh, from the sacrum all the way up to the occiput or the occipital bone of the skull. Uh, it will connect to the vertebral bodies and the intervening uh, intervertebral uh, discs. Uh, because the surface area anteriorly uh, is 
is pretty large, uh, the width of the anterior longitudinal ligament is also going to be uh, wide. The anterior longitudinal ligament will help uh, stabilize the vertebral column uh, during uh, extension. So if we flex, move forward, and then uh, extend, it will help to uh, stabilize the vertebral column in that extension. The more we extend, uh, the totter uh, it becomes. Uh, located posteriorly uh, and attached to the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies as well as the posterior aspects of the intervertebral disc is our posterior longitudinal ligament. And we see a deeper portion of the posterior longitudinal ligament here, and then we see a more superficial uh, component of our posterior longitudinal ligament. And in through here, it's attached uh, to the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies. And note that we have the pedicles on either side. So consequently, because the pedicles are limiting structures, the posterior longitudinal ligament uh, is much narrower as a band than would be the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament. And then when you get at the level of the intervertebral disc, you no longer have that limitation. So there are lateral uh, extensions of the posterior longitudinal ligament on either side of the central bands. Uh, the posterior longitudinal ligament does just the opposite functionally of the anterior longitudinal ligament, and uh, that will be to stabilize the vertebral column uh, during uh, flexion. Uh, also, if you have a herniation of an intervertebral disc, note that this is a weaker area here out laterally from the central band, uh, so a herniation of the intervertebral disc is going to come out posterolateral to your posterior longitudinal ligament on either side. Uh, another type of uh, ligament that's associated with the vertebral column uh, is the ligamentum flavum. Flavum um, means yellow, uh, and these are yellow elastic ligaments that run from lamina to lamina. And so this area here is the ligamentum flavum on this side. And here is the ligamentum flavum on the opposite side, again, running from lamina to lamina. And we see more of these ligaments as we move uh, in fairly in this particular illustration. Uh, right down here is the posterior midline. So projecting uh, into the screen away from you as, as a viewer of this lecture uh, would be the uh, spinous process of this vertebra and then the spinous process of the vertebra below. And if you look in the posterior midline, uh, you can see that there is generally a very slight uh, gap uh, between the uh, ligamenta uh, flava as they do not uh, fuse in the posterior uh, midline. Because of their elastic nature, uh, ligamenta flava uh, will help to limit or check separation of the vertebral column uh, during a flexion. So as you flex, you put greater tension on the elastic uh, ligaments, and the more tension you place on them, uh, the more that will help to limit or restrict uh, that range of movement. Interspinous ligaments uh, are going to run between the spinous processes. Uh, so we see them here and here, spinous processes. And then we have an inner uh, spinous uh, process here. Uh, these are uh, poorly developed in the uh, cervical uh, area, and we can also see in this particular view uh, a nice intervertebral disc. This is the nucleus propulsus uh, region uh, that was uh, discussed uh, a moment ago. And then here's an end plate uh, here above and an end plate uh, here below. And so this shows uh, those structural features uh, more clearly. Uh, interspinous ligaments uh, will help to limit or check uh, the separation of spinous processes uh, during uh, flexion. Uh, we also have supraspinous ligaments, and these will run from the tips 
of spinous processes to the next ones uh, below or above, depending on where you start. Supraspinous ligaments will run from the vertebra prominens, again known as C7, and will uh, extend uh, inferiorly uh, to the uh, level of the sacrum. These two uh, will help to limit uh, separation of spinous processes uh, during flexion. The uh, ligamentum nuchi uh, runs from the occiput down to C7. So it's this midline ligamentous uh, structure. Uh, the specific attachment point to the skull is known as the external occipital protuberance. And the inferior limit of our ligamentum uh, nuchi will be at the spine of C7, the vertebra prominens. So the reality here is the ligamentum nuchi uh, represents the um, uh, superior expansion of the supraspinous uh, ligament uh, within this particular anatomic uh, region. Uh, it will become taut during flexion, and as a result of that, it helps to uh, limit uh, that movement. Now that brings us uh, to our summary. So what are the uh, take-home messages from this particular uh, lecture on the vertebral column? Uh, first, the vertebral column uh, is made up of five uh, segments, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. And typically, we will have 33 uh, vertebrae that make up the entire vertebral column. The vertebral column is made up of primary and secondary uh, curvatures. Primary curvatures form during development and increase the volume in the thoracic area and pelvic area uh, to house important organs uh, within those two uh, anatomic regions. Secondary curvatures in the cervical area and in the uh, lumbar area represent developmental uh, milestones. Uh, secondary curvatures uh, will develop uh, in the cervical area uh, when the infant is learning to hold up his head and neck. And then in the lumbar area, uh, the, this secondary curvature will develop uh, when the infant is learning to uh, walk and become more mobile. The two basic uh, components of a typical uh, vertebra would be the body and the vertebral uh, arch. Segmental specification is demonstrated by structurally modifying uh, the vertebral uh, components. And then lastly, vertebral articulations and attendant ligaments will confer uh, and either limit or increase the freedom of range of movement. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, on this lecture on the vertebral column.